Hello, today we are going to review the um, heart and neck vessels, which is chapter 19 in Jarvis. So if you want to open your book to chapter 19 and also open up your PowerPoints so we can talk. And I also have a volunteer model here. I don't think he had a choice, but he's, he's my model today to do heart. Um, in, in your uh, book, um, as you know, after reading Jarvis for so long, you will be um, seeing that there's a review of anatomy and physiology. There's also our subjective questions. Um, subjective history data and, and then also objective data and then we will talk about some abnormalities. So let's get started. Um, in your book, let's see, it does tell you, show you a, a picture um, and there is actually one and also in your power, PowerPoint that it talks about the precordium and the precordium is considered the area or your chest wall. It also talks about the base and the apex. Now this is weird because when you think about the base of something, I always think of it as being the bottom, but in the heart, the base is the top. So if you look at your, if you look at the um, uh, picture in page 456 or your PowerPoint, it's going to show you that the base is the top of the heart. So it's the top. And where is the apex? Well, an apex also can mean a point. If you think about an apex of a mountain, it's the, the peak of the mountain. Well, the peak of your heart happens to be the point and it goes downward and it, it's, that's why they call, and this is a, this is a male model, um, so I can expose this male model, but if they would, of course, give me permission. But so you've got the base of the heart up here and you have the apex of the heart coming into a point. So when you guys have already talked about vital signs and other things, when you talk about the apex of the heart, we're talking about the where's the best place to have the listen to the heart rate and it's called the apical pulse. And the apical pulse means the apex of the heart. So where is the apex heard the best? Well, in adults, it's heard at the fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. That's the apex of the heart. Um, it's also the best place to hear the mitral valve. The mitral valve, of course, is the valve that's on the left side of the heart uh, between the, um, the two chambers, um, the atrium and the ventricle. So that's important to note as well. Let's see what else we've got here. We, well, we just reviewed the atrial, the atria and the ventricles. You have, of course, four chambers of the heart. You have a right, a right atria, left atria, a right ventricle and a left ventricle. You also have valves, and so some of the sounds we hear are related to valves. Um, the valves are tricuspid and mitral. Those are called atrioventricular. Atrioventricular valves means they're between the atrium and the ventricles. And the valve that's on the right side of the heart is called the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid means it has three cusps. And then the valve on the left side of the heart is called the mitral valve, and it is two cusps, or it has two cusps. So those are between, those are atrial ventricular uh, valves. We also have something called the semilunar valves. Now, semilunar valves are the valves that close between the vessels. And we have both a, a pulmonic and an aorta. Let's think about pulmonic. The pulmonic valve, the pulmonic valve is the um, pulmonic is the artery that goes between the right ventricle and the lungs. So if you, the pulmonic valve, it's the um, pulmonic valve is that valve in the pulmon pulmonary artery. Just to review with you, the pulmonary artery is the only artery that's carrying non-oxygenated blood. And of course, it's carrying it from the right side of the heart. So it can be oxygenated by the, the lungs. Now the other valve that's called a semilunar valve is the uh, pulmonic valve. The pulmon I'm, is the, I'm sorry, is the aortic valve. Well, where is that? Well, the aorta comes off from the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is feeding oxygenated blood to our whole bodies. And so we have an aortic, it's also called a semilunar valve. So we are hearing, we're trying to listen for these different sounds. 
um, when, we're, when we're doing our exams. You've got a very good picture on page 457, and I've got it repeated here in the PowerPoint about the different um, heart wall chambers and valves. So it kind of shows you what I just talked about, where the pulmonic, pulmonic valve is, and then the aortic um, valve coming over too. It also shows the tricuspid versus the mitral valve. So kind of look at that. You also probably can notice from this picture that, and you've had this in anatomy, is that the right side, um, the right side of the heart is less thick than the left side of the heart because why? There's more pressure in the left side. There's, there's more pressure in the left ventricle. That's the highest pressure chamber of the heart. The second highest chamber of the heart is the aorta. That makes sense because that's where the blood is being pushed out on um, contraction. And so they, it has to be a high pressure area. Um, if so, that's important to know. So that is the lub, you know, when you hear an S1, that's contraction. And S2, which is the heart sound, is, is dilation or diastole. So systole is lub, diastole is, is dub. And so it's called S1 and S2. All right, that's kind of a review. Um, it talks about diastole and systole. Um, the first heart sound is called S1, and the second heart sound is S2. Now, sometimes in young adults, also in children, but in young adults, when they take a breath in, you will see that their heart rate speeds up a little bit, and that is called sinus arrhythmia, and that is absolutely normal in um, a young adult, and also in children, that's normal. Um, so it's called sinus arrhythmia. There are some other sounds too, called the third and the fourth heart sound. The third heart sound is not normal, nor is the fourth in um, adults. Um, so the third heart sound would be um, where you have, um, is they use the term like Kentucky. And so S1 and S2 is lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. So if you're thinking about S3, it is a vibratory sound that happens before that lub sound. So it would be like Kentucky. The Kentucky is the lub-dub. So it's a sound that you're gonna hear before the normal S1 and S2. A fourth heart sound, which is also abnormal, is a sound that you would hear at the end of the cardiac cycle. So it would be like lub-dub and then a swoosh sound. And so some people call it ten C, and the C part would be where you'd hear that extra fourth sound. Um, another thing we're listening for when we listen to the heart would be murmurs. All right, let me back up. When I talk about how to examine a heart at every location, and we're gonna talk about five locations, every time you put your stethoscope on the heart, I want you to say this to yourself, four things. Is it regular or irregular? That's first. Um, and we'll, we're gonna go through each one of those, but is it regular or irregular? Secondly, do I hear a distinct S1 and S2? In other words, do I hear a distinct lub and dub? Lub dub, lub dub. Thirdly, do I hear any extra heart sounds? Any clicks, any S3s, any S4s? And then finally, do I hear any murmurs? And the slide I, I just got onto was the murmurs. So murmurs, a murmurs definition is a whooshing sound or tur it really is turbulent blood flow in the heart is the murmur. So a whooshing sound in the heart is called um, a murmur. It's turbulent blood flow. Um, off, uh, just to a side, turbulent blood flow in an artery is called what? It's called a brewery. So it's the same definition, but it's in a different location. It's a brewery if it's in an artery, it's a murmur if it's in the heart. Um, if I do hear uh, a murmur, I'm gonna ask myself or any other sound, where do I hear it the loudest? Like what location? And we're gonna talk about locations here in a minute. Um, how loud is it? That would be intensity. Does it occur uh, all the time or is it just for, you know, like, is it in the lub or is it in the dubs? In other words, in S1 or S2 because that can be important as well. And when does it occur? Is it, does it occur when the person's sitting up or laying down? Does the movement of the patient change the characteristic of the, um, characteristic of the, the extra sound? Uh, we also have the issue of conduction, 
And of course, conduction has to do with electrical activity. So you are going to see a, a, a wonderful chart on page 459 that talks about um, what's happening in the heart and how that is associated with what we call the ECG or the electrical cardiogram. And as you get further and further into nursing school, you're going to be able to learn more about the ECG and what each of the heart uh, cycle is doing and also the electrical activity is doing related to that ECG, which is the electrical graph of what's happening. One of the things that we know is that there are, um, uh, we have some terms that you're going to learn in patho called cardiac output, preload, and afterload. And pretty much, I mean, you've got the definitions of them, but pretty much the um, cardiac output equals the stroke volume times the rate. So let's think of cardiac output. Stroke volume means how much blood is being pushed out of the heart, and then the rate is how fast is the heart pumping. So when I think of cardiac output, I'm thinking the, the left ventricle is squeezing blood out through the aorta. And so how much blood is coming out times how much the heart is actually beating per minute is called the cardiac output. And lots of things can affect it. And as you get more and more into nursing school, we'll talk about medicines that can affect it, heart failure can affect it, the kidneys can affect it, certainly. Um, we also have terms called preload and afterload. And basically the preload is what is the venous return that builds during diastole. Um, and so it's how much you have during that diastole, which of course is refilling of the heart. The afterload is the opposing pressure, and it basically is um, the resistance against which the ventricle must pump its blood. So the um, page 462 has some of these definitions. Just to give you a clue about what they are, and there's going to be more discussion about those terms um, during pathophysiology. To do a, uh, a good assessment of the heart, we also have to think about the neck. Um, so we do think about the neck vessels as well. And of course you have, this person has um, a trach on right now as the mannequin, but you have carotid arteries that run on both sides of the, the neck. You also have jugular veins. And there's several different ones, internal and external jugular veins. So a carotid artery, you've got a good picture of this um, actually in your PowerPoint and in your book showing you where they are, the, um, the veins and the arteries. Um, so just knowing the location of them, the, art, the carotid artery pulse is the same as any pulse in the body that we're going to be talking about. It is graded from zero to four plus, two plus is considered a normal. And so when you, when you, um, if you uh, feel for a, a carotid pulse, you should do it one at a time and grade it. Grade it means it's kind of a, it's subjective. Obviously zero means no pulse and that's, emer that's an emergency. One would be a weak and thready pulse. Two is considered a normal pulse. Three and four could be a bounding pulse. But if you have a weak pulse um, on one side, you would probably, your thing that I would do is take the bell of your stethoscope and I would take the bell of the stethoscope and have the person in neutral position with their head, maybe hold their breath, but listen to the carotid arteries and listen for any brewies. That's what I would be listening for. If I couldn't palpate, or maybe I palpated it, and it felt like it's even stronger. But usually if you hear a brewy, then you've got some kind of obstruction in that carotid artery, which can be dangerous as far as um, causing a stroke or something else going on. So um, we also know that jugular vein pulse is something you'd look for. And usually, if you have a person turn their head to the right side and they're, that, and they're kind of in a position, maybe they're even flat, you could put them flat, and then you, you would look at the right side, you would look here and see, do I see any jugular vein pulsations? Well, if you do see jugular vein pulsations, then crank the head of the bed up. When the person cranks the head of the bed up that ha that's normal, usually those pulsations subside. So sitting a person up will make those pulsations turn or go away. 
or at least not get worse. If a person has right-sided heart failure, the right-sided heart failure, if this pump is not working, it backs up to the body. So it, if the pump is not working and going forward, it's going to back up like a dam. And the first place you're going to see right-sided heart failure is distended jugular veins. So if you see JVD or jugular vein distension is another term for it, that is, that is a direct indication of possible right-sided heart failure. Something to keep in mind. Um, and that's why we want you to look for those pulsations. So, um, like I said, right-sided heart failure backs up, left-sided um, also backs up. The right side backs up to the body. You're going to get edema, JVD, um, probably spleen and liver enlargement, which is splenomegaly or hepatomegaly. Those are some of the things that you'd be looking for. If the left side of the heart is failing, where does it back up to? It backs up to the lungs. So you're going to hear shortness of breath. Not, you're not going to hear it, you're going to see it. You're going to hear crackles. This person's going to be coughing up stuff. That's what happens when you have left-sided heart failure. All right, now what are we going to talk about with history? So here we are with a history. Well, so I've done a little bit. Um, it does have a little bit about cultural issues with the heart on page 466. In relationship, especially that coronary artery disease we know is the number one concern for the United States. Um, and men and women are smoking, and so smoking is an issue. We also know that hypertension can cause cardiovascular disease um, and wear the heart out and cause um, heart failure as well. We do know that hypertension, uh, the highest rate of hypertension in, in the United States is African American men have the highest rate of hypertension in our country. Um, smoking contributes to that. We also have more uh, obesity, uh, high cholesterol, and uh, type 2 diabetes starting earlier and earlier. So you could read about those cultural issues and even since this book has been published, we continue to get these issues and getting younger and younger, even with children developing cholesterol, high cholesterol, um, or, and type 2 diabetes, um, not just type 1 anymore. So here are the things I'm going to ask a person about their heart. I'm going to ask them, of course, chest pain. And chest pain seems to be the classic thing. So I'm going to ask them, do you have any chest pain? And what do we ask if it's pain? Point to where it is. Um, I, I want to know where it is. When did it start? Um, is it something that comes and goes? Have you had it for a long time? Um, where is it? Point to where it is. And so they may put their fist right on their chest. They may put it up here. They may put it in their back. And so chest pain is one of those funky things that can radiate to the back. And we know that a classic chest pain, which is known as angina, can be for men all the way down their arm. It can go up their jaw. There's all kinds of things that can happen with chest pain. Um, if we want them to also describe the character of it. Some of the words we use would be crushing, stabbing, burning. You, you can Sometimes you hear an elephant is sitting on my chest. Um, some of them might say it's indigestion. Uh, just I want to say something about atypical groups. If a, it, these are some of the symptoms a man may say happens, the crushing, the burning, the down the arm. Women people with diabetes and elderly clients that might have some peripheral neuropathy or numbness, they may not have these classic symptoms. Um, they may have chest pain or something happening with their heart, but they don't feel it like that. They may feel, a woman may come in with indigestion or stomach problems, but, or weakness. The classic symptom that binds all three groups together would be shortness of breath. So any woman that comes in with a stomach ache and indigestion symptoms, I want to do an ECG on them just to make sure that they don't have any cardiac problems. Um, someone that's diabetic, again, they may not be able to feel all the pain receptors. And if someone with, um, that's elderly, that if they've had some hypoxia or something going on with their heart, they may not have the capacity mentally because of poor perfusion to the brain to be able to tell you their symptoms. So those are some of the things to keep in mind too. Is this pain brought on by any activity? 
rest, emotional upset, eating, sexual intercourse, cold weather, what is causing this? And what are the associated factors? Do they become diaphoretic, which is heavy sweating? Do they change colors, uh, cyanotic or ashen gray? What are some other things that happens? Do they feel their heart skipping a beat? Um, some people will talk about fluttering, that type of thing. Um, what have they done to help it? This is when you want to ask them about their medication history. Are they currently on nitro? And of course, you'll learn more about nitro and pharma pharmacology, but nitro is a sublingual tablet. They take one every five minutes times three times. And if it doesn't help, you need to have they need to call 911. That's the kind of the, the mantra we have. So does, it, does this pain go away when they rest? Does this pain go away uh, when they take their medicine? If it's true pain that might be a myocardial infarction, resting or medicine's not gonna help and they need to get medical help right away. Uh, shortness of breath, we have talked about that already with respiratory when we were talking in that chapter, uh, chapter 18, but respiratory is, and this is why the lungs and heart are kind of married, they're together. So in what activity has brought it on? How long have you had it? Uh, is it constant? What's position makes it better or worse? Are you taking any, um, taking any um, medicine for it? There are some terms that are listed under subjective. One of them is what I already talked about, DOE, dyspnea on exertion, and that is where you're walking and you start having um, some shortness of breath. Another term that you'll see is paroxysmal, um, that means it comes and goes. Um, it, it wakes you up at night. Um, the, the, the term PND, Paroxysmal, that's, I cannot say that. Paroxysmal, nocturnal dyspnea, is dyspnea that occurs, uh, wakes the person up about after two hours of sleep. And um, that type of dyspnea is associated with uh, congestive heart failure. And we already talked about orthopnea and the need for pillows. Um, back to cough, uh, do you have one? How long have you had it? Is it dry or is it productive? Remember, if you've got left-sided heart failure, it's going to start being productive. Um, then fatigue, both with cardiac and respiratory for that matter, the person might be very tired. So are they tired all the time during the day? Do they take naps that they've never taken before? Um, what is helping? What, what seems to make it worse? So what is their fatigue level? I also want to know about color changes. Have they had cyanosis or pallor? Um, both cyanosis and pallor are conditioned. When you have low cardiac output, you can have both uh, uh, blue skin or pale skin, cyanosis. One of the deepest signs of low oxygenation is something called, um, it's, it's called uh, circumoral cyanosis, and that is where circum means circle, oral means around the mouth, and that is cyanosis that comes with blue lips, and so that is a deep-seated uh, uh, oxygenation issue. They also may have trouble with edema, and once again, we, you know, even with left-sided heart failure, there might be a little periorbital edema, but certainly with right-sided heart failure, they're gonna have edema like crazy. It's gonna be down in their legs. And we'll talk about edema, but you test for edema by pressing on the tibia of the lower legs or down at the ankles. And so edema, the edema is also graded from zero being no edema to five being very deep pitting edema that doesn't go away and the extremity is visibly um, swollen. So those are some of the things that we talk about. And, and there is a chart um, under peripheral vascular chapter that shows you how to rate edema. So we're asking them though, has there been any swelling in your feet or legs? Um, do you wear any kind of clothing, that, any shoes that feel tight? Um, does it help to rest or elevate your feet? So what have they done to take care of that? I also want to know about nocturia. And nocturia means the person has to get up in the middle of the night to, to urinate. And so a lot of times when you have a lot of fluid in your body uh, and also compromises in, your, um, compromises in your cardiac output, your kidneys are affected. 
As a matter of fact, just for a tidbit, your kidneys need 25% of your cardiac output of your heart. So if your kidneys are not getting that because your heart's failing, they start going through, the kidneys start going through kidney failure. And one of the things that you can see with kidney failure sometimes is poly, it's called polyuria. Polyuria means excessive urine. So sometimes that excessive urine spills over and the person has to get up at night to urinate. So you wanna know about that. Um, I also wanna know, have they had any cardiac history themselves? Have you ever had angina or chest pain? Have you had any uh, cardiac catheterizations or anyone ever say you've got a, 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 were you diagnosed as a child with any kind of valve issue? Have you had any conditions as a child like rheumatic fever which can cause heart or valve damage? Have you had acute glomerular nephritis which is a kidney disease that can cause um, heart valve damage as well? I want to know when their last ECG was and if they've ever symptoms, have they had any kind of stress ECG, um, any high cholesterol, any history in the family? Do you have a mother, father, grandmother, grandfather that has had um, a history of cardiac disease or any kind of vessel problems? I would like to know that too. Hypertension or any other kind of coronary artery disease. And then you're going to go over their personal habits. We call these cardiac risk factors. And of course, the cardiac risk factors include alcohol, um, use, if they have high alcohol use, smokers, um, poor high fat diet, um, lack of exercise, those would be things that would be called modifiable cardiac risk factors. There are also some that are non-modifiable and we, I know that on NCLEX they always talk about what are modifiable risk factors versus non-modifiable. So modifiable are the ones like diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol that you can affect. The non-modifiable would be your gender, um, or your race, um, your age. Those things are non-modifiable. And so we also know that um, usually men um, and African-American men, I said, have more hypertension. Um, and then the older you get, you more have more possibility of cardiac disease. Specifically for the aging adult, I might continue and on page 470 it has a few more questions. Have they had some history of cardiac uh, chronic conditions or hypertension or coronary artery disease? Um, any lung diseases which could affect the heart? Um, I also want to know if they are taking any medicines uh, like digoxin or digitalis. Um, and any problem with the environment? Um, there are some other drugs that you'll see listed on page 469 when we are talking about medication history. Are your patients on uh, blood pressure medicines? Any beta or calcium channel blockers, which are used to slow the heart down, digoxin or diuretics to help with the fluid? Are they taking a regular regimen of aspirin as an anticoagulant to prevent stroke? Any other drugs, including street drugs, so you try to develop a trust relationship where they'll be honest with you. All right, those are all the questions. So now it's time to do your exam. So how do you do an exam? Well, again, for a cardiac exam, it's possible, and I do this all the time. I did some bus driver physicals a couple weeks ago, and we didn't lay down for the heart exam. But if I, I heard a murmur or something, I might have them lay down so I could check and see if lying down affects it. But for most folks, you can have them sit up for this. You will be doing, with your head to toe performance exam, you usually do the lung exam sitting up, and then you have them lay down in bed to do the cardiac. Um, exam and the abdominal exam. So for this demonstration, I'm going to do it with a client sitting up. I'm going to make sure that they're, um, that my, my, I've got privacy, warmth, warm my stethoscope, and also um, be able to hear things adequately. So um, first you want to look at the jugular veins and the precordian. So I'm looking at the veins on both sides. I'm looking at the precordian, which means you have to see the precordian. So if it's a male client, you could pull this down. If it's a female client, you can pull the gown down to here and then secure it and then raise it up to here. You're looking across the chest. I'm looking at the jugular veins in the neck first, but then I'm looking across the chest for heaves or lifts. Heaves or lifts are where the heart has to work so hard that you can actually see it bounding or rising. 
Um, so I'm looking for heaves or lifts, so I'm going to look down and across. Um, and what I also will do then is I've inspected, but what I'm going to do with the neck vessels then is I'm going to palpate the carotid arteries. Now again, I said this person has a trach, but I'm going to do the carotid palpation one time. You don't ever palpate the carotid arteries at the same time because you could actually cut off circulation, the person would pass out. So I'm going to palpate one at a time with their head in a neutral position, which means just straight forward. And I'm going to grade the pulse, OK? I'm also going to then have the person, um, I'm going to go ahead, and this is the fun part. You don't have to do this for your final head to toe performance exam. But I would go ahead then and listen with my bell to each of the carotid arteries to, think, to, to listen for any breweries, which we talked about as turbulent blood flow and could mean that the artery is occluded. So after I have. Uh, palpated and listen to the carotid artery, I'm going to look at the jugular vein. Now once again, it talks about how you can estimate it and measure it, etc. You don't have to do that. But you can turn the person's head to the right and inspect. And if, they're, if you wanted to have them laying down, but you're looking for any obvious jugular vein distension. Probably normally you don't look for people's jugular vein distension, but if you have them turn it to the right and have them be still. Sometimes I get a light, like my pen light, and it's called tagen tagental, tangential light. If you look at um, pulsations with a light, sometimes they, they really mm, magnify or illuminate, which is kind of awesome. So put it across there and look for that pulsation. And, and then again, it should, it, if you raise them up a little higher, then it should stay the same. If a person has right-sided heart failure, it's, it's going to be very strong. It's going to be something that you see. All right, so inspecting the anterior chest, it even suggests that I look across the chest with a light. I can do that, looking for heaves or lifts. Now, I know pretty much where the heart is, is positioned, so I kind of know. If you look on page uh, 475, it shows you how the heart is in the center of the chest, underneath the sternum, and then it goes over here to the right side. So what I have to think about is I have to think about where is this chest. I've already inspected, and now I'm going to palpate. So it, in, your, in the lab that you're going to do, you're actually going to be palpating the chest. Where should I palpate? Well, I'm going to palpate. Um, uh, by the way, when I was inspecting, I was also looking for pulsations. In some folks, you can actually see the apical pulse pulsating, which would be okay in, in very thin adults. Sometimes in children, you can see that apical pulse. A fifth intercostal space, I would you sometimes see it. If not, then I'm going to try to palpate it. But when I'm palpating the heart, I'm going to put my hand across the base of the heart. Remember, the base is the top. Then I'm going to put my hand along the left sternal border, and then I'm going to put my hand across the apex of the heart. So I'm going to put my hand across three places. And what am I trying to feel for? I'm trying to feel for any heaves or lifts, heaves or lifts. Um, now, the other thing I'm going to do, or any vibrations, there's, a, there's something that you can palpate sometimes it's called a thrill. And it's kind of thrilling to feel the thrill, but that's a pun. The thing that about the thrill is that if you feel a thrill, when you listen to that heart, you're going to hear um, a murmur, most likely. Murmurs are graded, and we'll talk about that, but murmurs are graded one through six. One, two, and three is kind of a mild whooshing sound or murmur. If you get a murmur that's a four, a five, or a six, then you have a murmur that's strong enough that it's turbulent blood flow in the heart that you're going to be able to feel a thrill. And so to me, it's like a, a kind of a vibratory feeling thing that you feel. So if I put my hand here or here or here, again, the, the base along the side and at the apex of the heart and felt a thrill, then I'm going to listen at those same spots and listen for a murmur. So this is palpation. I'm also going to try to palpate the apical pulse just to see if I can. So those are the two things that I am going to palpate. Um, next, advanced practice folks may do some percussion, but I don't think we need to do percussion here in the heart. What I am going to do next is auscultate the heart. So to auscultate the heart, 
Um, there's different mnemonics that you can um, determine, but you do have a little bit about auscultating the heart as far as the sounds. Remember, um, you're auscultating for um, the rate and rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? You're um, identifying a separate S1 or S2, which is the lub and dub. You're listening for extra heart sounds, which would be really the S3, S4 clicks that shows some things going on in, in the heart. And then you're also listening for murmurs. Now, we have five different places that we're going to listen to in the heart. Um, so you're, the, the locations of these, and some people use different mnemonics. The mnemonic that I use is always pumps too much. And that's because A starts with aortic. A is the first one. So always means aortic. And the aortic sound is the second intercostal space the right sternal border. So I put my stethoscope right here. The pulmonic, which is always pumps, is right across from that friend. Pulmonic is the second intercostal space, left sternal border. Then I do have another spot called herbs. So creep on down. It's the third intercostal space right along the sternal border. Um, then I have the, um, the T is, see we got always pumps, and then we've got herbs in there, but we've got tricuspid. Tricuspid can be found at the fourth or the fifth intercostal space. You'll see it in your book as the fifth. So you can actually count down your ribs. Intercostal means between the ribs. So it's going to be about here, the fifth intercostal space. And then finally, I'm going to do the mitral, which is the much. If you've got a male client, you can see that it's right below the nipple. If it's a female client, they may have to displace their breast in order to get to it. Um, when you get in peds, we'll talk about location because it's not necessarily in that fifth intercostal space with children. So after I've listened, each place I'm listening, aortic, pulmonic, I'm going to pick up herbs, tricuspid, and mitral. At every space, I'm listening for regular or irregular, separate S1 or S2, any extra heart sounds, and any murmurs. When I get to the mitral, which is also known as the apical, which is also known as the PMI or the point of maximum impulse, I'm going to listen for 60 seconds. And in 60 seconds, I'm going to count the apical pulse. After I've counted the apical pulse for 60 seconds, I'm going to turn to my bell. Of course, I'm telling my patient not to be worried at this point. At, and, and you can do two things. You can start up from the apex and go backwards. And so you could go mitral tricuspid, back to herbs, back to pulmonic, and then over to aortic. Or at this point, since you've gone down one way, you can start over again with your bell and then once again go always pump too much. Aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, mitral, and then I picked up er um, herbs. Um, some people I've heard also use the acronym APE to MAN, which is A-P-E to help you remember the E for herbs and then the T and the M. So those are the five spots. That's what you're listening for. Um, and it, it talks about um, um, in, this, on, on, in your book on page 475 that you, know, you don't have to listen to just four sounds. You can listen to other places. Make sure you do a Z pattern. Make sure you use both the diaphragm and the bell. Um, if you hear any extra sounds or any murmurs, try to identify, do you hear it with S1 or S2, in other words, in the lub or the dub. Systolic murmurs are generally benign or not as serious as hearing them in the second sound, which is the dub. So there's a little bit of information here on murmurs. It has to do with the timing, how loud is it? Um, does it radiate? What position was the person in as you, as you heard it? Obviously, after I'm done with my exam, I'm going to recover my patient up as well. So here's some sample charting. Um, the subjective would say something like there's no chest pain, dyspnea, orthopnea, cough, fatigue, or edema, no past history of hypertension, etc. Then you have some, and you can read that along with me. The, here's some sample charting, and you are going to be doing a lab on cardiac. So it talks about the carotids are two plus and equal. 
bilaterally, get used to the word bilateral, symmetrical, those are all words we use for health assessment. You, it talks about jugular vein pulsations pul were present with supine, which means lying down, and they disappeared when elevated. So that's why I'm saying you can have the person laying down and then pull them up and they can disappear. Um, you, you palpated or you inspected the percordion per first. There were no visible pulsations, heaves, or lifts. And then you palpated. There was no tenderness. Um, there was no um, thrill or heaves or, or no tenderness. And that the apical pulse was, pulse, uh, was palpated at the fifth intercostal space midclavicular line. And then finally, you're going to auscultate. And what you can say is that the heart rate was 68 beats per minute and regular. There was a separate S1 and S2 with um, uh, no extra heart sounds and no murmurs. That's how you would rule out those extra heart sounds on those abnormalities. Um, so that's the way to chart your cardiac. I hope this has been helpful to you as we've gone over the different systems. The rest of this PowerPoint does go into a little bit more detail and it correlates with your book in chapter 19 on some of the findings you are not going to be required to know every single one of these findings, just the most common ones. So um, we talked a little bit about the third and fourth heart sound. Um, we talked about a thrill, that it's a palpable vibration, a lift or a heave. Um, we did not talk about congenital heart defects because that is a childhood. You'll get that patho when you come to pediatrics. And um, you also have some valve defects and there, there's um, really detailed murmurs that you're not responsible for, but just generally knowing what murmurs are important. Couple questions. Um, so again, I hope this uh, cardiac uh, assessment and neck vessel assessment has been helpful to you. And please let your faculty know if you have any questions. Thank you.